tonight. This is my latest work of art. Uh, not that you should care about that. But <clears throat> I'm showing it. I don't know if you can read. It says future next to the mouse, present in the middle, and past at the posterity, which is not a coincidence. Uh, the reason I picked this is because, in certain ways, it's a metaphor for how we do art and present it and how we teach and give information, and for colonialism, and for teachers as colonizers, and everything that somehow is wrong, both with art and with education. And I'm really interested in merging both to the point that they become indistinguishable and use art as a form of cognition and not a form of production, and use education as a form of creative expansion of knowledge, which is basically the same that should happen with art. And that brings me to how museums work and biennials work in general, in which the educational program is a public relation program which is detached from the curatorial aspect. Curatorials are first-class citizens, and they own the knowledge, and educators are second-class citizens who then figure out how to get the audience to consume what the curator has presented. So, given that as an introduction, I want to talk about another Biennale of Mercosur, which was, in my case, uh, six biennial in 2007. And I was lucky enough that the chief curator was a friend of mine, Gabriel Pérez Barreiro, and he decided to create the title of pedagogical curator and asked me to fit into the title. And because we were friends and there was no ego competition, we managed to start designing the biennial from scratch together. So I was not a public relations person, but I was really in charge of, while we were setting up the biennial, to also design the communication part. So he took care of picking the artist, which I didn't have much interest in anyway. And I took care of how do we involve the public during the event and not as consumers of the stuff presented. So the first step was to ask artists to formulate in one or two paragraphs in the format of problem statement what is the research about that ended up in the piece they were showing. This was the most difficult part of the project. I had to send back the paragraphs over and over and actually emphasized with uh, primary school teachers. <clears throat> but finally it worked, and the text was then presented on small walls uh, nearby of the work, and the public would then read the paragraphs, check the work, go back to the wall with a paragraph, and leave comments about the success or failure of the piece and suggestions. And those were shown on the same wall of the paragraphs. And with that, we achieved a primary goal in that particular biennial, which was to start a flow of education where the public would educate the public coming after them. And with that, leave us out of the picture. It was very successful. About 500,000 people saw the biennial during the period, which was equivalent to Documenta or Venice. And the suggestions of people were terrific. Parallel to that, we sent assignments to school systems in 52 cities in Rio Grande do Sur, in which Based on the problems of the artist, 
we designed assignments which were open-ended and were dealing with the conditions that generated the work that was exhibited, but not with the work itself. So there were transformations in classrooms that were vaguely related to work in the biennial, but that only would be identified after the students were bused to the biennial and would then see, oh, this piece answers the assignment I did in my class, and actually it stinks and my piece is much better. <laughs> or, wow, I hadn't thought of that, this is more interesting. The aim was to put both public and students in a situation of not consuming the past, but rather share the attitude towards the future and digest together with the artist in the same creative process to reach their own solution. Their own solution did not have to be within what we call art. It could be in any discipline or any transdiscipline as long as it satisfied the formulation of the problem with which we dealt. So that was something that then we carried on, or I carried on with a team, with uh, Maria del Carmen Gonzalez and Sofia Quiroz. We had worked in the uh, Cisneros Foundation for a while. And we did the manual, the teacher's manual for the Guggenheim Museum for Under the Same Sun. And in that manual, we also turned around the issue. We went from problem formulation that generated or might have generated the work in the show to second stage of assignments to be done in any discipline students wanted to do it to then uh, find out what the work was that generated those assignments and to then discuss questions that were opened up by the work of art and by the problem that was being addressed, and that was, again, as transdisciplinary as possible, touching on as many items that did not belong to art, but that could be discussed from a creative point of view. So the thing for me as an artist and as an educator is really to try to facilitate the challenge of given systems of order and to allow people to mix orders and to create alternative orders, even if they are illegal, in quotes, or if they are subversive in the sense that they challenge the given order and try to temporarily put it out of order. And with that, bring them to continually try to expand knowledge. Now, the fascinating part of expanding knowledge, and I think that's what makes art an addiction, is that once you move the wall that's enclosing you in your knowledge, you realize that there is a wall still there that you have to move again to expand knowledge. So it's a Sisyphus curse, which you keep rolling up the ball and it keeps falling on your head. So you keep moving the wall and you have to move it again and again and again. But that's not only addictive, but it's also fascinating. And it's on that count that I think we should start dealing with art as education and education as art to the point in which we won't be able to identify anymore who is a teacher or who is an artist, which ultimately is a market labor division and has nothing to do with cognition. Thank you. So you've devoted your life's work to um, minimizing that split between educator and artist. Yes. And I know a lot of people in this room are probably thinking about that, trying to do that. I'm just wondering if you could say more of when you realize you, that's been a success, that you've conflated those two. 
I don't think that this is success. I hope that three or four generations from now, something will happen. Four generations? Yes. You, <laughs> that's your, your best well, estimate. I, I think uh, <laughs> we're using the wrong watch to time. We want instant gratification. And it doesn't work. So for those who are trying to do the same thing, what, what would you recommend? For to be patient. <laughs> Good note to end on. Thank you. Yeah.